Good morning. Uh, my name is Beverly Kelly, and I am here with my husband, Peter Kelly. And we're here on behalf of the Lexington Remembers Committee, which is a group that was started by Mary Gillespie in 2005. And the group has done oh, well over 50 interviews and oral histories of people who have made an impact or made a difference in Lexington. And if anyone is interested in seeing any of these, I'd like to mention that they are available if you Google Lexington Remembers or Lexington Remembers YouTube, you should be able to get most of them. And some of them are absolutely fabulous. So for those of you who are interested in the history of Lexington, um, please uh, take advantage of it because they're, they're just wonderful. They're a lot of fun too. Yeah, a, a good variety. You can pick and choose who you want to hear about. It's not just people, it's organizations also. Yes. And um, they're just, they're terrific. So, um, but this morning we have someone who's very special um, to the town of Lexington and her name is Mary Keenan. And we'd like to welcome Mary this morning. Um, welcome Mary. Mary. Never <laughs> lived in Lexington, but she taught in the public schools for 35 years. So she saw a lot of changes in the school department and she has a lot of interesting little stories to tell us about uh, the schools and she'll go on she also wrote a book called in haste julia and she will be um, talking a little bit about that too and a little bit about the center of town and other things places around lexington so, but our focus is pretty much on the schools today our focus um, is on Mary. Uh, but our focus is on <laughs> Mary. So I think I'll ask Mary to give us just a, uh, an introduction of herself and um, your little bit about your background, just a minute or two. And then maybe Peter can start by asking some questions. So where'd you come from, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Bev and Peter. It's quite an honor to be asked to do this. Uh, I remember Lexington from when I was a little girl and when we would come back from a vacation and needed milk, my dad would drive us over to Shanahan Dairy on Pleasant Street and then we would go up and visit the Minuteman and so forth. So I always had a warm spot for Lexington. I graduated from Belmont High and then from Tufts and I came to Lexington for an interview and they said we only like to hire experienced teachers. Mm -hmm. So after I taught in uh, two towns in Connecticut, I came back for another interview and that was 1964 and I got hired. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the beginning. started. And that, that started. was a good start. 35 years later you retired. <laughs> yes. There's a lot that so, happened in between. Right, from so 64 to 1999, you are a history and in some t times English as well right. in the school system. Right, and we've all benefited by it. Unfortunately, mm -hmm. I just missed you. I was in Diamond, but I left in the spring of 64. You came in September of 64. Tell us about your first experiences teaching over at Diamond in 1964. Well, first, my first experience was uh, meeting the superintendent, Dr. Rudy Fulbert. And he was quite an amazing person, and he put Lexington schools on the map with a school in Moscow and other faraway places. And when I went back to Tufts, they asked me where I was teaching, and I said, Lexington. They said, oh, Rudy's town. <laughs> and it really <laughs> he was. He was a legend, wasn't he? He was a legend, yeah. even in his own time. <laughs> and so when I started at Diamond, uh, John Hibbard was principal, and I would always, even today, when I see purple leaf, loose strife blooming in the fields in the summer, I think of Principal John Hibbard because he always would start his back to school letter with, I can see the purple loose strife <laughs> from my window. Time to get back to work. Time, exactly. And That's in funny. those days, 1964, it seemed that there was a new school every year. Mm -hmm. There were many new teachers. and. Uh, I remember whenever I, I went into his office, there'd be a red phone on his desk. And the red phone was a direct connection to Hanscom because it was during the Vietnam War and Diamond was in the flight path to Hanscom. And leaving in the afternoon, the planes would be flying so low we could wave to the pilots and oh recognize my. their faces and so forth. 
Fortunately, the phone never went off <laughs> while we were there. Do you remember that, Peter? I mean, you knew I don't, John I Hibbard. I remember John Hibbard. I knew him well, but I don't remember his red phone. I think he kept it in the drawer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But it was in the middle of the Vietnam War, so... Um, oh, I remember the C-30 cargo planes coming across and shaking everybody. Yes. Particularly if we were out at gym in the field and those boys came by, it was... Or girls. <laughs> Pretty scary, <laughs> probably, for young kids. It was loud. Yeah. And loud. at that time, there was a dress code, very strict dress code. Girls had to have skirts that touched the floor when they knelt. Boys <sighs> could not wear jeans because the rivets in the pockets would damage, would scratch the <laughs> furniture. Would they have such things to worry about today? <laughs> Even for right. teachers, there was a dress code, no pants for women, but then one um, school steering committee meeting, John Hibbard was not there, and the steering committee passed a resolution that women teachers okay. could wear pants, he wear and he came back quite startled. So that, that changed while you were there then? That changed yeah. while I was there. Yeah, good. <laughs> uh, while I was there, Metco started, and we had two Metco students from Boston in, in the seventh grade, Phil Scott and Arthur McLeod. It was also a lot of team teaching beginning then. Mm -hmm. uh, team teaching had been at Franklin School, but Paul Brown and a couple of other teachers instituted team teaching at Diamond. And the first team was called Hertz because there was a lot of advertising on the radio, TV then <laughs> for Hertz, we number one. And so I was on the second team that was established and we called ourselves Avis. We try harder. Right. Right. <laughs> Till it hurts. So, well, uh, <laughs> going back to Metco, though, um, that's still in existence today. So it started in Lexington in 64. And or, or, or uh, maybe 66 or 67. Okay. I remember I started, I was on the second floor. And when Metco began, I was on, in the classroom on the first floor. Uh -huh. So... Uh, yeah. And do you remember the kids integrating into the... Into the groups in Diamond fairly well, or did you have those students themselves? I had Phil and Arthur, and I yeah. knew that they were fine in my classes. Mm -hmm. I never pursued them outside of, mm -hmm. when I was on cafeteria duty, all okay. seemed fine, but. Well, it's been a very successful program. It all has these been. years, and yes. still going strong from what I understand. And I had more Metco students when I was at Clark, and. Uh, Okay. I think the program, uh, my memory is it started in the, s in the fall of 66 uh, and expanded regularly year after yes. year as they realized how well the program was working. Yes, and I think it was working very well. Right. So let's see, is there anything else about Diamond? It was a um, time of oh. the National Defense Education Act, so there was no problem with textbooks. There was a lot of federal money available for education. So. Interesting. Well, there was one thing um, you had mentioned during the Vietnam War. You had a student, Noam Chomsky's, because they lived, and in fact, Peter knew the Chomsky's. Uh, they lived in Lexington, and their daughter went to Diamond, uh, and she, tell us that uh, story. Aviva was in my homeroom, and at that time, there was a lot of emphasis on you have to pledge allegiance to the flag. And Noam Chomsky was a strong protester of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And, I, and they said you had to report any student who didn't salute the flag. And mm -hmm. so my dad said, well, he had a solution. I could stand at the head of the classroom under the flag, setting a good example. <laughs> and so right. that's what I did. So and look to the flag. So and whatever was flag. happening behind you, you didn't know about That's right. I just assumed oh. everyone was following but she my did. example. But assumptions okay. are good. Yes. <laughs> I, but she did not. I have no idea. Oh, you don't know. Okay. No. Okay. That's well, the way to keep it. <laughs> you know, I Googled Noam on the other day. I think he's still living. He is. Oh, oh, he is. I had seen a reference to him on a video program. Um, wow. Speaking on. He's got to be some issue. close to a hundred or. Well, got to be up there, aren't yeah. we all? <laughs> <laughs> but but he Peter knew him. I guess he did some work for him when he lived. Uh, in, uh, I think he lived on Longfellow Road. Longfellow in Road, in the right close to Diamond. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so that's interesting. Then though. you moved to Clark in the fall of seventy. 
72. In the fall of 72, uh, there was a lot of hype about this new junior high with an IMC, an instructional materials center, as big as a football field. Oh. And Mr. Hibbard was named principal. Um, John Capone, the assistant principal, was going. And so I joined the group of teachers that were going. But it was very different architecture from <laughs> other schools in Lexington. Still it is. Had <laughs> very few windows. And that was the year of the prison riot in Attica, New York. Oh, yeah. And so the school was labeled Attica East <laughs> for its lack of windows. Mm -hmm. I had a classroom that was windowless, that had a glass door that looked out to a hallway with a glass door that looked out to another hall that you could see the fields. And so, anyway. You had to set your mirrors up just right to yes. see it, huh? No, but I wonder why they would choose architecture like that. I think just Jim McGinnis, uh, who was assistant uh, superintendent of facilities at the time of the design process, and of course they had the permanent building committee be even back then, there was a lot of concern about vandalism. Kids were always throwing oh. rocks at windows around the schools. Uh -huh. I don't know who those kids were. And uh, <laughs> Jim was determined to design a school that didn't have the risk of people throwing oh, rocks at it. Plus the clock was set back off of, I uh, can't remember the name of the road. Stillman Road. Uh, uh, I can't recall, right off of Walton yeah. Street. Yes. Very sort of right. isolated. Yes. No mm -hmm. roads going by it. No. So it That's was going to be vulnerable to, uh, you know, kids on weekends and stuff. So right. that was the theory behind that windowless school he built. Yeah. Yeah. And what else about the building itself uh, do you remember? Something about staircases? Oh, oh. Stairs. Well, yeah. first of all, uh, we were on double session until the middle of October at Diamond because it wasn't ready. And then oh. when it was ready, all the lockers came locked shut. And so Mr. Capone spent the weekend opening all the lockers <laughs> because they had locked them and he they had put a the combinations inside. Shut the, the, door. Combinations the combinations inside. were all inside. <laughs> yes. How did he get? The, he must he have had a master key, so oh, I had to oh. open them all. And oh, gee. Anyway, and <laughs> then we had some window leaks, and they used to come around and lower the ceiling lights and let out the water. And they were still workmen uh, putting finishing touches on things like bulletin boards in the IMC. And one day I was there with students coming in in the morning and a workman was over there putting up a bulletin board and it was the usual tussle of seventh and eighth graders and ninth yeah. graders had joined us mm -hmm. ninth graders were unhappy because they had been at the high school right, right. and now they had to go back and be in a junior with the littler high. kids but they yes. get to be the big kids on campus yes, yeah, that's but true. they still, but still, to be still at the high they school. wanted to be at the high school and a workman looked over and said a person could grow old before his time around here. <laughs> and anyway. So there were still workmen working when you first yes. were there. Yeah. And then there were very few, there was no central staircase. There were narrow mm -hmm. staircases at various points. Mm -hmm. And at first, everybody tried to go up and down whatever staircase was needed, uh -huh. close to wherever Didn't they work. were going. Oh, and they didn't have very changed. good sight lines in no, the stairs. It was no. very difficult to see what was going on in the staircases. It so was. what did they do about that then? And so we had an up staircase and a down staircase, oh. and you couldn't go down the up or up the mm -hmm. down. And mm -hmm. Anyway. Um. <laughs> and what's so special about 1985, Mary? Oh, I was not. Oh. Yes. Teacher of the Year. In yes. My secondary yes. Teacher of the Year. Congratulations. Jim Banks was Elementary Teacher of the Year. Uh-huh. Okay, but congratulations I have to on mention that. that. When we started, uh, one of the neighbors, Sophie Ho, came in, and at that time there were a few students of Asian heritage, mm -hmm. and she was so afraid that we wouldn't understand how Chinese worked. Mm -hmm. And so she told us there were four rules. Here, over 50 years later, I remember just two of them <laughs> there were no tenses and no plurals. So if a student who spoke Chinese at home uh, said like to flower or yesterday I go, tomorrow I go, this was not a grammatical error in Chinese. To them, right. It was in right. English. Oh, that's interesting. And there was a way of correcting them while teaching them at the same time. And I was always grateful 
to Sophie. Oh, Sophie is a great lady. She's still around and yes. still very yes. involved yes. in everything and a great um, a person for the Asian community. You know, she's a real advocate. She is, and there's a room at the library named for her, I believe. Oh. Down in the lower I didn't even know I that. Okay. No, she's a great lady. Uh, we had teams at Clark, only they weren't English, they were named for the languages, so it was a um, CEP, C A D A and Seban um, for eighth grade. Um, the team that had the French names was Wheat. Uh, eight. Isn't that the eight, number eight? Yeah. H U I T, Wheat. Right. And one of the um, students on the team called themselves the Hewitts. <laughs> H U I T. Okay, yeah. the Hewitts. Hewitt, so that became known as the Hewitts. Um, there was always a school wide field day at the end of the year where teachers, students would be out in the fields doing all sorts of games. And the science one science teacher, Art Latham, would make a wonderful <laughs> video that was the end of school thing. Mm. And while I was at Clark, a couple of students wanted to be in the Guinness Book of World <laughs> Records. <laughs> All and kids want them. <laughs> so they decided they would make the world's largest cho chocolate chip cookie. <laughs> and they... At Clark. Wish I had that dough. <laughs> <laughs> Literally. <laughs> and so um, they coordinated with some local bakery with the huge ovens uh -huh. and a flatbed truck that delivered this humongous chocolate chip cookie. And all the students came out and had a piece and pieces were given to us. And I remember I brought a piece to um, uh, a son of a friend in Rhode Island and said, oh, he had heard about that. Really? He, it was really, was really quite an event. So it was the largest yes, chocolate, at the time anyway. At the time. I don't, the largest chocolate I chip cookie ever baked. I haven't checked in this book of world yeah. records, huh. but it was the world's largest chocolate chip cookie. It put Lexington on the map at the time. Yes, <laughs> it hadn't been on the map for anything. No, yeah. right. no one ever Not heard of us before. Just no. for <laughs> the chocolate chip cookie. I'd never heard about that. Did you ever hear about that? No, I wish I did. I'd take a piece. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so, okay, anything else about Clark? Because uh, after that, you moved on to I the moved high on school. I moved on to the high school. And the high school was just so different. The kids were so much bigger. They, they <laughs> yeah. filled the seats. I, I was used to junior high kids. Yeah. Right. And uh, there was just so much of them. And <laughs> everything at the high school was rush, rush, rush. Yeah. I had five classes, four preps, study hall, lunch duty, and it seemed like, <sighs> Well, it well, was spread out so right. much, you know. Yes. The campus yeah. complex was but a challenge for everybody. But fortunately, I had all my classes in C House. Oh, you were okay. lucky. I was. Yeah. So that uh, was I sophomores? You were teaching 10th well, graders? by that time, the, the house wasn't for a particular grade. Right. The house just was for subjects. And okay. it was mostly history and some English teachers who were in C House. Okay. But mm -hmm. there were history and English teachers also in G and other places. When you taught both history and English, were the students the same in both the subjects that you had? Uh, that only happened at Clark. Oh, okay. That was the team system. That was the team system. And um, I had 50 fewer students. The average team at Clark was about 100 students. So I had 50 students, so I saw them double classes. Uh -huh. But it worked out well because we could do a history lesson and use it for writing and, yeah. you yeah. know. You used to call uh, them source themes. That you had to do a topic and do a paper on it uh, that incorporated your English knowledge as well as your history knowledge or you had to pick something. At least that was the way it was when I was oh. going through. <laughs> well, that pretty much was in the past when I was there. <laughs> oh. I remember I was teaching that. Uh, combined English history, the year of the bicentennial. Ah, and 75. so I okay. had mm -hmm. students come back and write what they had done for that event. Okay. And one student, John Whitaker, had gotten up and uh, talked to President Ford. He, he had, did. And I said, how did he manage yeah. that, John? He said, I said, the Secret Service must have been alarmed. They said, oh, don't worry, Miss Keenan. The Secret Service didn't even see me. Ooh. He just went up and tugged on President Ford's sleeve yeah. like he used to tug really? on mine for attention. And so I wow. had all the students write there what they had done for the bicentennial and then I had bought the special stamps uh -huh. and I mailed their 
account to themselves. Yeah. And now oh, with dance. 2025 coming up, I'm wondering, I hope some of them still have those envelopes yeah. with the stamps. That would account. be interesting to well, know. We, inside. we certainly remember when Ford came because we live, we've lived in the center of town since 73. Uh, and um, you know, we went up and took ladders, and because it was it was mobbed, uh -huh. and we climbed up the ladders to be able to see Ford. But we, you know, we were only a hundred feet from him or something. But wow. um, but like the other himself. the other thing I remember very well is the high school because we went through the high school too, and because it was such an open, a spread wide campus. Um, I still have nightmares, and I'm not joking, about getting to my classes on time. Because if you were in A, B, or C unit, and you had to go to J or G, you know, it took you 10 minutes. And I was frequently late for my classes, and I still You're always talking worry about, about the that. No, no, no. <laughs> but it, it was difficult. It, it was, was difficult. It was way too spread out. It yeah. was. That's good exercise. But, but that's the way it was. Tell us about, so. Mary, tell us about what you remember about the year of the teacher strike. Oh, oh, that was a sad time. What year was Do you that? recall what year um, that was? That was 1986, and it was over an unsettled contract. It was a week-long strike. Pardon me, it was 1987. It was a week-long strike right after Thanksgiving vacation. Okay. And I remember marching outside on the access road. There were a group of us, and oh. the then superintendent, Issa Zimmerman, came oh, by yeah. and said, how are you? And I said, not very well. I mean, I never thought I'd be on strike in Lexington. Yeah, yeah. But um, the stri I, strike I remember that, settled. too, because we lived on Forest Street, uh -huh. still do, uh, right near the high school. And I remember the corner of Muzzy, which was an access road to the high school, uh -huh. and Forest. There were a group of teachers holding signs there. Yeah. So that was, that was 1987. In the fall okay. of 87. Okay, yeah, after Thanksgiving. Um, there were some good things that happened. I was in the same building as Mary Gillespie, Aww. who founded yes. Lexington, Lexington Remembrance, right. yep. and she was very active in the Historical Society, mm -hmm. and so she suggested we have a reenactment of the 1880, 1833 town meeting, Aww. and uh, one of my history classes did that, and it was held at Museum of Our National Heritage mm -hmm. one Sunday afternoon. Why was 1833 picked? Yep as a date. Uh, was there something I think particular? because I was able to find a lot of information on okay. that. Okay, the information was available. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I had found town reports and, and other things like that. Uh -huh. And they were still uh, arguing about the, uh, the parking in the center. Yeah, they were <laughs> Couldn't get my horse in. <laughs> <laughs> they were arguing about the schools and did oh, we of them. And, do we Can need we schools? Can we afford right? them? And right. And right. things like oh, that's, that. So you did a dramatization? Did the kids play the, the town the meeting members? Each played, uh, the students each played a separate individual yeah. in town okay. who would have been a town meeting member. So yeah. was it an open town meeting oh, yes, yeah. at that point? Yes. Oh, open, not, yes. A, not a representative not, not town meeting like it is no, today. No. Yeah. And then there were questions from the audience. Uh, oh, that's great. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So yeah. it, was, it was fun. It was one of the highlights of my teaching. Well, year. yeah, I mean, drama, dramatizing something like that is always more interesting to the kids than just yes. reading about it in yes. a book. So and, good. Uh, was it? I was trying to think of his name the other night. His first name was Cornelius. He was a town historian. Cro Cronin. Cronin. Oh, I knew him well. And Neil. Neil Cronin. Neil Cronin. I grew up ne across the street from him. He uh, gave me a gavel. Yeah, oh, we he made him out too. of branches um, from the battle green. Yeah. Yes, we have one of his gavels, <laughs> too. Whenever there was a storm, you'd see him out there. He lived over on Belfry Terrace, and he'd pull the no, good... No, you're talking about Larry Whipple. Yeah. No, Neil oh, Cronin Neil lived Cronin on Utica Street. Neil Cronin was on yeah, Utica Street. I'm That's sorry. Okay. Yeah, it, 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 she's right, you know. <laughs> but I don't know all the well, years we've been married. Well, I grew up across so. the street from Neil, so yes, he would go down whenever get there was the a branches. storm right. and get the branches off of the battle green yes. and make gavels. So and you were so lucky to get one of his gavels. I had the gavel, and I gave it to the Historical Society. Oh, did you? I didn't okay. know if any other gavel from a wood from a tree on the green okay. had joined their collection. Well, that was nice of you to do that. Yeah, he was a great guy, Neil. Yes. Was. So was. thank you for remembering his name. <laughs> <laughs> well, she lived right next across the street yeah. from him, so yeah. she knew. I knew him well. <laughs> so those years, um, those years at the high school, saw a lot of changes 
you, let's see, you went to the high school in 86, so you finished your career in 99 uh -huh. at the high school. Right. And you generally taught both English and history those there years? It was just, it was um, American, you, well, first when I went there, for the first year I had world history, ninth graders. And then, because my field was American history, I had U.S. history, AP U.S. history. Uh, there was a political thought class that had been sort of in need of a teacher, so I taught political thought, and then I started a woman's history class, and political thought oh. and women's history were semester classes. Okay. Well, so they were electives, perhaps, yes. for junior and seniors. Yes, right. they were senior electives. Okay. Well, that so. may segue into the, the most recent women's initiative in Lexington, the Lex See Her. Yes. Are you, or are you involved in that? Yes. <laughs> Why don't you tell us about that then? Um, the Historical Society is the fiscal agent for Lex See Her, and so they needed two teacher, two Historical Society board members to be on the Lex See Her advisory board. So Ann Lee, the first vice president, and I were asked by Barry Kuhn, the president of the society, if we would represent the society. So I said yes. And Did you so have Barry Kuhn as a student? I didn't. I had his brother Mark. Okay. Who okay. Was oh, there were a lot of Kuhn. Sharpest kids. All sharp kids. <laughs> um, anyway, so Lex See Her, Jesse Steigerwald, and mm -hmm. Betty Gow put mm -hmm. me on the research committee and this and that and so I did a talk on the Wellingtons and I did some research and but I had started my research because when I was at Diamond I had uh, joined the Historical Society um, to see where were the women of Lexington. Okay. I wanted to make sure that I was telling the right story about the 19th of April mm -hmm. because coming to Lexington everything is the 19th of April mm -hmm. and I thought oh my gosh if I get, a, get it wrong I'm going to be fired. <laughs> so I joined the Historical Society and Ruth Morey was there. She was uh, the first woman president of mm -hmm. the Historical Society. What a kind lady. Mm -hmm. And so uh, she was a diamond one day, had no idea what for, and I saw her walking down the hall and I said, you know, where were the women of Lexington? Where can I find information? And she said, call up Larry Whipple. Tell him I told you to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I called, she gave me his phone number and I called Larry and he said, meet me at the archives, which at that point was a little red brick building attached to, well, Freestanding. Yes, it yeah, was The Hancock Clock House used to be on that side of it Hancock was. Street. Yes. And in 74, in advance of the uh, bicentennial, uh, the society moved it across the street to its original location. Where it is now. But they left the archives building, which uh -huh. was like a little brick outhouse. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but it had all the records of the town, but, uh, of uh, the society in there. I remember the day the Hancock Clark House was moved. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. I was rushing to get there. And my family said, don't worry, it, moving a house takes, takes time. a while. Oh, right. <laughs> but when I met with Larry, Hancock Clark was still on the south side yes. of uh, Hancock Street. Okay. Anyway, Larry um, said, okay, women, we have Ellen Stone, who was a philanthropist, first woman elected to the Lexington School Committee mm -hmm. in 1887, I think. Um, because in 1879, Massachusetts passed a law that women could serve on school committees. Oh, okay. So, um, earth shaking. Yes, absolutely. And <laughs> so, I looked at Ellen Stone's thing, she was nice, but, you know, so we brought out huge boxes, the kind you'd store for a coat in, and I was looking through and I found a uh, diary for her aunt, Julia Robbins, so okay. Uh, okay, that's I, how you got. I began reading involved. the diary and I used some of it in teaching and did other research. Then when I retired, I yeah. put together my story of Julia Robbins in haste, Wonderful. Julia. But, um, well now let's hear a little bit about Julia, okay? okay. A little bit, because she- She was uh, Ellen Stone's aunt. aunt. Right. Uh, the Robbins family were very prominent in East Lexington. Mm -hmm. Stephen Robbins founded a fur business, and at that time they had furs from northern New England and Canada, and they'd make the furs into fur-lined gloves, hats, t 
tippets. Muffs. Muffs. <laughs> tippets were the lining of a coat, and so you'd have a strip mm -hmm. of fur, boots, all sorts of things for New England winters. His son, Eli, took over the business and became one of the most prominent businessmen in East mm -hmm. Lexington. Mm -hmm. He also had a tavern, and when there was a conflict with the selectmen, Eli hired Daniel Webster ah. to solve the problem. And Webster, well, yeah, I'm sure he did. Yes, <laughs> solved the problem. And so Eli had married Hannah Simons, whose father was the one who threatened to blow up the meeting house if the British soldiers stepped in any oh. further on the morning of April 19th. So we have a Simons Tavern, or it used to be, uh, is, on Bedford Street, yes, almost right. 128. Same family then? Same family. Okay. They were okay. all over town. Okay. Right. And okay. when you trace the families in town, everyone is related to everybody <laughs> else. Right. Mm -hmm. And so a family tree is just about impossible. But Julia Robbins. Was Eli's daughter. He had Abby, who married um, Lothrop, who was a minister. He had Hannah, who was hearing handicapped. He had Ellen, Julia, Mary, who died of cholera, and a son, Eli, who went into business in New York. But Julia... She abandoned Lexington, did she? Well, she didn't abandon <laughs> uh, Lexington. Yeah, yeah, no. She found herself in... Uh, she went to the enemy. Concord. Oh. <laughs> Concord. Oh, but um, Julia <laughs> was <laughs> just artistic and went to Boston School of Design. At that time, the railroad had come to Lexington, 1846. And so she went into Boston, took courses there, and got a job at the Lowell Mills, when most of the workers at the Lowell Mills were men from the British Isles, skilled in oh. patterns and weaving. And Julia did that. Before that, she had acted as her father's secretary. He, um, Eli had built the stone building, had mm -hmm. built a hall for people of any persuasion to come and speak. He believed in freedom of speech. So you're talking about our East Branch, what used to be yes. the East Branch Library. Yes. That the and stone it's building. The stone building. It's called the Stone it's Building. It's called the Stone Building because yeah. Julia's niece, Ellen Stone, mm -hmm. gave it to the town mm -hmm. well, okay. with, for some financial compensation. Uh -huh. And when it was a library, I, don't, I haven't been by on foot recently, but there was a plaque outside with the famous people who had spoken mm -hmm. there, John Pierpont, whose grandson was J.P. Morgan, mm -hmm. Parker Pillsbury, uh, Reverend Thore Samuel May. Thoreau and Emerson both they spoke did. there, didn't they? Yes, Emerson yeah. spoke there. And then when people in East Lexington established a church, they had Emerson as their preacher. Mm -hmm. And it met there for, until a fallen church was built. Oh, oh, okay. Oh, okay. So, so I didn't know there was a direct connection between the stone building and fallen church. As I believe, I it, know they're right was. next door to each yes. other, but I didn't know there was a connection. Yes. Right. And then you all know the story about fallen church and Charles Fallen, the German uh, professor of German at Harvard, who was a refugee from Germany in the Revolution, had lost his job for his. Uh, strong stand on abolition, mm -hmm. but that fit right in with the Robins, who mm -hmm. were strong abolitionists, and Julia was arranging abolitionist speakers. And then they formed a East Lexington religious uh, free Christian community, and then the men in the community voted to have it as a uh, Unitarian church, and the women wanted it to stay free Christian. Anyway, um, but they were dedicating it, and Charles Fallon was in New York where he was minister then, and he was lost on the steamboat Lexington mm -hmm. of all steamboats oh, right. mm -hmm. that caught right. fire yes. in Long Island. We Sound. have a framed picture of the, the steamer Lexington, and it's got the caption about how Fallon died on his way to the dedication for Fallen Church. He died in the, the burning and sinking of that ship. We have that at, at our house. That's amazing. Yeah. I'll show it to you someday. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, let's Small see. World. So there are a lot of amazing women in Lexington. When I was teaching, I used to get the Lexington Minuteman <laughs> and Marge Batten. Oh, she, she amazing she woman. Was yeah. Moderator yeah. of town meeting right. for years and years. I had her daughter Pam, and she oh. was just so down to earth. Yeah. Oh, she yeah. was a wonderful lady. 
Yeah. She certainly was. She and Ruth Morey the really the two set of the tone mm -hmm. right. for public service for mm -hmm. women in the town. Yeah, um, Ruth lived right down the street from us for quite a while, oh. and our boys delivered her newspaper to her every day. <laughs> but <laughs> oh. she's been gone for a while now. But no, they were two very strong, wonderful women who did a lot for Lexington. And there's a plaque for Ruth at the uh, Masonic Museum. Oh, is there? Going up the stairs uh -huh. on the left. Ah. The Masonic uh, on the Bivis Museum Street? of our National Heritage. Oh, 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 on Merritt Road. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Oh, yes. Right. I, I didn't know that. Uh, mm. Is that up at the community center, or is that no, down at the museum? It's down at the museum park. Okay. Is That's it? closed to the public now, isn't it? Or is I'm it not sure what they're doing. Yeah, they they changed their whole. They changed their whole exhibits. And right. Modus operandi and. Right. I thought it was not they even. They still run programs. They have a nice auditorium there. They do. They do. That's where yeah. the 1833 town meeting right. was. Yeah. Right. Plus oh, seats. right. But we. <laughs> and a town <laughs> meeting was held well, there for a few a while. years. Uh, right. We held a town meeting there. I guess they uh, do renovations at Cary Hall, so uh -huh. uh, we use that. Right. Twelve so. o'clock. Right. So. But. Um, so with the well, 35 years that you snuck in from Belmont to teach mm -hmm. Lexington students, you must have seen not only a lot of changes in the educational system of the town and how things were approached, particularly with history and English, um, but also just the changes in the town in general, how the town evolved in the years that you might have come through. Because in the mid 60s, the Burlington Mall was made, built, mm -hmm. and so the dynamics of the center and the dynamics of the community were slowly changing. We saw things come and go. Uh, I used to frequently stop after school at Cary Library, which had wonderful references, great librarians, mm -hmm. great selection, and so forth. And I remember the center block and the Hunt Building, mm -hmm. okay. and I, it was the center block that burned down. Right, right in across 1970, from the library, I think. Yes. The Hunt Block went down, I think, in the mid-60s. Right. Mm -hmm. That was a big brick building right in the center where uh, Batucci's restaurant is right. now. Yeah. But the center block is where uh, Via Lago is today. Yes. And oh, right. that burned in a spectacular fire in 70... It was I think 71? it was 70 or uh, 71. Yeah, somewhere it was when I was still there. at Diamond because one, one morning mm -hmm. we just heard Fire engines and <laughs> sirens, oh, just incredible. Mm. And Mr. Hibbert said the Hunt Building. The, the no, central, central block. Central, central right. block. Well, it was and a wooden building, yes. so right. an old wooden building. So it, it, was, not it was, what, three, three stories? Three stories. Yeah. We and remember so well. Three. It might have, yeah, I think probably it was three. three. At least three. Yeah. You should have brought your book there. I did, pictures. but I left it in the car. Well, that's a safe place for it. <laughs> oh, but well, yeah, it was a big, big building, and it burned. So a lot of things around. happened, didn't they? Yes. A lot of changes. One of, uh, speaking of your book, Bev, when I was teaching at Clark, I had gotten a Scrad grant to buy copies of it. Oh. And <laughs> so my students used to love to look at uh -huh. and see yeah. what yeah. was in their neighborhood <laughs> and so forth. Right, right. But I remember coming to the 1775 house with my parents and uh, friends of theirs. Now what was the 1775 house? Um, right now it's the Lexington Montessori School right. on Pleasant Street. Oh, okay. And it was built in early 1800s. It was the home of Peter Wellington and his wife Hepzibah, Benjamin Wellington and his wife Polly. They shared the house. One, uh, Benjamin had 11 children, Peter had 13. but. Children, some wow. <laughs> children were out and married by the time the younger ones arrived uh -huh. because a woman was usually pregnant for about 20, 20 years, years of her life. <laughs> Gee. But wow. anyway. Especially yeah. in the Wellington family. <laughs> <laughs> in wow. the, uh, and so it became a restaurant. It became a restaurant yeah. sometime in the 60s. And friends, uh, my parents came from Arizona and dad said, oh, let's go out to a very nice restaurant, the 1775 house. So we got there, and much to Dad's friend's chagrin, it was dry. Mm -hmm. He could not get a drink before mm -hmm. dinner. But I guess that was remedied, oh, um, in 2004. 
Well, well it might have been before that because that it was a it had more than a hundred seats in it, didn't it? Because yeah. the um, they were given liquor licenses for more than a hundred seats well before two thousand four. Hundred seats or more in a restaurant. But yeah. if you had fewer than a hundred seats, you couldn't get a liquor license until two thousand four. Yeah, so yeah. I'm not sure which date it was for. Right. For that. But the other thing about the Wellington, I, I have a couple of postcards which I brought to me, and they took some pictures of them before we started this interview, and I think they'll incorporate them into this. Um, postcards of the 1775 house. And on the back of one of them, it says that one of the Wellingtons, maybe it was Benjamin, was the first man captured by the British on April 19, 1775. That was the father of Benjamin. Oh, right, the Benjamin. Benjamin's father. Yes. Okay. But okay. the Benjamin Wellingtons were also the first to bring milk from their dairy into Boston. Oh, really? They would. Raw oh. milk and it got bottled in so Boston. So there were no dairies in Lexington at the time? Well, oh, there were lots of dairies in Lexington. And a lot of people, a lot of families in Lexington had dairies, but he was the first one to bring it into Boston. Oh, I'm sorry, the other way around. Yes. Took it from Lexington into Boston. Yes. Okay. Um, and okay. that's one of his claim to fame, and I'm mm -hmm. trying to uh, narrow down whether it was the father, Benjamin, or the son, Benjamin. Yeah. But it was a Benjamin Wellington uh -huh. who did that. Well, and I, I actually, when you had told me that the other day about your experience at the 1775 house, I called Lynn Wilson. Uh, a lot of you know her from Wilson Farm fame. And she worked there for a number of years in the late 50s and early 60s. And she remembers that they were just starting to develop houses around that whole area. And it had been an 18-hole golf course, a big full 18-hole full course. Uh, not related to, uh, what was the, uh, Potter Pond. Potter's, uh, yeah, Potter's Pond. Potter Pond had a golf course, too, which is in the same vicinity. Right. But the golf course straddled both sides of Route 2, which at the time was just a small little kind of a country road almost, had two lanes going in each direction, but nothing like the large Route 2 that it is today. So she remembers the golf course, and she remembers it all being developed all around the 1775 house. Well, I'm glad they... Kept the 1775 or the yeah. Wellington right. House or right. the Montessori School. Yep, yeah. it's still being it used for a good purpose. I remember when I came to Lexington in the spring of 1964 for my interview, because when I first interviewed, they said we like teachers with experience. So I came back five years later, and uh, Route 2 was under construction then. Ah, okay. And so it took okay. more than couple of months it was mm -hmm. an it was ongoing years. project and <laughs> yeah. houses on the Belmont side were moved mm -hmm. and right you can still see a sort of dead end right. oh there is well there, there was uh, what's that uh, street Blossom on? Street and then on on the Concord Avenue side it's Blossom Street but it was cut off by Route 2 so the other side is Blossom Crest and that ah, happened it with okay. I think Wellington uh, it was a road that crossed, then there's Shade Street and Old Shade Street. There were many huh. streets that they discontinued the crossing opportunities once Route 2 was expanded yeah. and do made you, wider. Do you remember the little gas station, Child's Gas Station? Because we used to buy our gas there all the time. It was really at the end of Watertown Street. Wat not wa not Pleasant, two. but Watertown Street and Route 2. It was a Jenny. Jenny Gas, yeah. if you remember Jenny. No. There isn't Jenny anymore. I remember when the new houses on the west side of Route 2 were built. Okay. Minuteman Highlands or something right oh, after. Oh, Peacock Farms? No. No. Uh, well, past okay. Peacock Farms, and you can still see those houses today. They are before you get to the church Yeah. as I you're coming you up Route 2 west mm -hmm. because okay. I was in, I guess, grade school then and a my oh, best friends. Uh, Bowman, by Bowman Elementary School. There's a Bowman Elementary School yeah. there. And, oh, I was uh, thinking the other Worthen side. Worthen Road right? East. Those, yes, yes. Uh, oh, uh, Worthen Road was going to connect from Route 2 to Bedford Street. And they put pieces in, but they never completed the connection. Mm -hmm. um, but those houses there, they still call that Worthen Road East. Yeah. And those houses were built during the 60s. And yeah. you remember that being all developed? Yes. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So, but I don't remember the gas station. I guess you I don't. bought my gas in Belmont before <laughs> I ventured. That's reasonable. Yeah. To yeah. Uh, 
far away. Yeah, because Childs ended up going over to where Lexington Toyota is today. I think there was a Childs either oh, he had in a, East Lexington. In East Lexington, and that's right. where the railroad station was. Yep, there, yeah, was, there was one Pierce right there behind 1846. Uh, Pierce Dunford. Bridge. My day. Uh, it no, was, I thought it was one called Pierce Bridge. Yeah, was uh, that that was further along. Yeah, that's that where was where uh, Maple Street. Yeah, was. yeah, well, okay, right. that's what I was thinking. In there is there was another one over by Lexington. Gold. Uh, what's the seasons for? And, uh, oh yeah, used to be Gold Ribbon Farm or something. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of changes happen when you hang around <laughs> as long as we <laughs> have. Yes, <laughs> yes, and I remember Wilson Farm long before the addition. Oh, yeah. Oh sure, it's changed oh, yeah. a lot. Has, Somebody should do a. Uh, we'll catch up with those. Yeah, no, I, we I are had Scott in seventh grade. Oh, did oh, you? Really? So uh, that's a guy you can't forget, right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> He's a great guy. He is amazing. <laughs> well, he we is. talked to Lynn and a friend of hers, Bud Downey, who also grew up in Lexington, and uh, she said he's got a great memory. So we are going to be doing an interview with Lynn Wilson and Bud Downey, maybe in the spring, and bring in Scott. Oh, that's a good idea because he was the one who traveled. I think to the west coast to find the barn to dismantle to replicate when they were re remodeling oh Wilson back in the, what was that the 1980s uh, with the big the new barn yes. where the store is now yes right but it was scott i think who traveled around finding the barn that he uh -huh. wanted you mean he had it dismantled yes know. Oh, because Rick Bechtel designed that well, yeah, new... Yeah, the framing. We'll have to ask Scott about that. Uh, we'll get yeah. him. We'll catch him. That's a good idea, though. He could be part of the interview as Maybe long as his Scott mother's saw okay with barn that. he liked. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. We need to ask Scott. Uh, right. Yeah. right. So, yeah, he might have found okay. something and then duplicated it right. instead of dragging it home. <laughs> um, it home. A couple but. of other things on the notes here. Um, well, you, you've talked about Cary Library, um, but also the Belfry Club. What's your memory of the Belfry Club? Just this huge old building, <laughs> this gray behemoth of a mm. building at the end of, is it Clark Street? Well, uh, Forest uh, and Mu Muzzy and Forest. Yes. Yeah. Right. Forest and we Street. lived directly across the street from that. Yeah. And the night of the fire, which was... Our kids were little. Um, uh, Christopher was the only one around, and he was a baby, so yeah. it had to be uh, seventy eight. Uh, I, I thought was Eric was around, but anyway, I remember the police, the firemen coming in and using our bathroom during the fire. Really? Uh, you don't remember that? <laughs> um, yeah, it burned in a spectacular fire. Another spectacular. <laughs> Again, it was a big, large, old wooden building. Yes. Um, yeah. Had you ever gone in it? Did you ever? Never. Have? Okay. Never. Because he grew up right across the street from it oh, on Clark had, Street. Uh, yeah. Miss Merrill's dance thing. Oh, Miss Merrill's and, uh, dance classes there. Uh, it was the social. Uh, oh. It, it was the social the club of the of the town. Oh, it was. I can uh, remember I being in Hancock School for a meeting. Oh. When it was still a school. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it was so claustrophobic. His really? mother went to Hancock school and he and his sisters all went to Hancock school uh, we yeah. all had the same teachers it seemed <laughs> oh. well but not your mother but yeah, we enjoyed it we lived right across the street got yeah. home to go home for lunch right and but his uncle used to spend a lot of time at the Belfry Club I remember hearing they had a tennis that. court there oh he was and into it tennis. was a tennis club oh. yeah oh, it had a lot it had bowl didn't it have bowling alleys in it too yeah, yeah and bowling alleys and basement. outside tennis and all sorts mm -hmm. of things. I remember when Crafty Yankee was first starting, and it was on Waltham Street. Well, <laughs> I have to correct you on that. I'm sorry, Mary. No, that's You're okay. thinking of Golden Hands, I think, the, the Yan yeah. place, because yeah. Crafty Yankee, we did a little research, and she'll tell you. Well, um, Carla Fortman, do, do you know Carla? Yes. Oh, through the Historical Society. She started, oh, sure. yeah. she started um, the Crafty Yankee. So I called her and asked her, and she said the first location they had was on Muzzy Street. It's the first, if you come down Muzzy from the center, from Mass Ave, first building on the left. It's a little, sort of a reddish okay. building. Yes. They had half of, it's a tiny little building. Uh -huh. They had half of the upstairs originally, and that was in 1980. And then she said they took over the whole, sec the whole second story mm -hmm. of that. And then, oh, I forget what, how many years later, then they moved to their second location, which is where the Crafty Yankee is today. So okay. I think maybe Peter's right that you're thinking about the Golden Hand. What I'm thinking of is a street coming in from uh, Forest Street, a direct run to Mass Ave. And so 
Okay. If I thought that Crafty Yankee was on Waltham Street, it would just be a block. No. Oh, right, yeah, that would be Vinebrook Road at the corner of Vinebrook Road, well, I think. Oh, and I think yeah. she's thinking of Muzzy I, I'm Street. Just thinking of, yeah. I was thinking of a street that went straight into Mass Ave. Okay, that okay, was well, so that that Muzzy, Muzzy Street. Right. So, okay. I so stand, that's, that's where it was. I stand corrected. No, so, so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you no. know, I thought, gee, I didn't, you know, we both grew up here, and um, I thought, gee, I don't remember it on, on Waltham Street, and that's why I called Carla. Good. And she was delighted to know that we were interviewing oh, you, by the I way. I know it wouldn't, I wouldn't have ever been in the Golden Hand, because... Oh. That's sort okay. of not so a I was not seamstress. You just got Waltham Street and Muzzy Street mixed Exactly. Up. We're going to forgive you for that. Mary. Okay, thank <laughs> you. Thank you. So how well, you is there anything else that we want to cover today? Or you um, want to or mention. The, yeah, that you want to cover. Anything Things that, that would be interesting for us to document I mean, in your time and knowledge of Lexington. Yeah. Well, I think we're sort of entering a new stage with the uh, Lex Seher Monument. Mm -hmm. yes. uh, have have they established forward. a location for that yet? Uh, I, I think, think that final approval one. goes to selectmen. Right. I, I think they've got the preferred one, which is right at mm -hmm. the entry of the visitor center uh, parcel oh. at uh, Merriam Street and Massachusetts oh. Avenue. Oh. And they sketched a design for it, but I don't know if it's I been didn't blessed know. by They've the board of selectmen. They've chosen the sculptor. Yet. It's yes, going to be they've chosen the artist. They have selected they have. the artist. Oh. Meredith Bergman, who did the wonderful woman's memorial on Commonwealth Ave in Boston. Ah, of, um, Oh, Phyllis, Phyllis um, Wheatley, Lucy Stone, and Abigail Adams. Oh. And she also did the one at Central Park in New York. And so we have a real star. Yes. That's Design wonderful. Will be and it'll be a, a statue of uh, like marble or do you know what no, material? No, uh, it's a... Oh. Uh, it's a bar relief. Yeah, oh. it's a relief, oh, right. Okay. And it's sort of like panels, I think, uh, vertical panels that depict different women, mm -hmm. uh, specific women, at different periods of time in Lexington. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if read you your go emails, on Lex Seher on the website, there's okay. an interview with Meredith Bergman with her to plans. See that. I'd like to see that. So, okay. So that would be good. Yeah. Okay. And then Lexi here did the banners mm -hmm. of women. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I was so surprised to see myself on a banner. Oh, really? <laughs> I didn't. It's, oh, it's that's the one wonderful. in front of Cary Library. Oh, that's which, a place which for Which pleased me. Appropriate. And that um, Julia and her sister have a banner. Oh, wonderful. Um, uh, Julia and her sister Ellen, who were both yep. suffragists, uh -huh. because when she married the Concord farmer, she didn't give up causes. Okay. She worked for a municipal suffrage okay. and uh, moved to Concord. And but she certainly married uh, well, because the Barretts are very well known and, and still in, 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 in Concord. Concord. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah. Wow. so that takes sort of come full circle. Comes full circle. That's right. And then there's also a banner for the Wellingtons, uh, oh. particularly for Caroline and her sisters who were involved in the Lexington Women's Suffrage League in the 1870s. And so they grew up in the what became the 1775 mm -hmm. house. So everything it's in town is related to everything <laughs> else. Yes. And everybody in town in the 19th century is related to <laughs> <Okay>. everybody <laughs> else in town. Uh -huh. Well, that's but it's an amazing mystery, town, it? and I've been lucky to be part of it. Well, and we've been blessed to have you be part of it for 35 years Thank and you. counting because you're still involved in Lexi yeah, Her and the historic. You're on the board of the Historical Society, and I'm the it? clerk of the Historical Society, yeah. and I'm chair of the Collections Committee. Oh, gee. So uh, well, that's yeah, a lot well, of work to deal with. You have now everything. <laughs> all all the archives information is now at the Monroe in the building. Yes, there. we opened the mm -hmm. uh, new archives October seventh, mm -hmm. and they're open to the public as of November first. Oh, oh, that's nice. Okay. So we're looking forward to. Wonderful. So uh, that's where you work when you involve yourself. I had worked in the basement of Hancock Clark, where the old archives right. were. Larry Whipple, being a trusting soul, gave me a key to Hancock Clark uh -huh. and showed me how to unset, you know, the alarm. cancel the alarm, right. and I'd go down to the archives. But yeah. yes, so now the archives are new, sparkling, nice home, good, yep, above good. ground. Yes. Above ground, Good with place open, to be. Oh, hopefully yes. a more open situation yes. for you to, Although to do the, your work. The files are still in the basement, but that's access for staff. Okay. Okay. So anyway, okay. so it's been quite a run. 
Yeah. Yes, well, we thank you so much for contributing so much to Lexington, and, and we thank you for your continued, continued. contributions oh. <laughs> to oh, thank Lexington. You, you people have so, done your yeah. own contributions. Bev, and I know you had a White Tricorn Hat Award. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I did, and Peter yeah. did too. <laughs> oh, so yeah, double they, they White They put one on my head too, and <laughs> double a white lot of people were yeah. <laughs> so, so thank you, so, and thank you for being willing to do this today and giving up time from what I'm sure is a busy schedule for you um, with all the things you're involved in and oh, we I'm, appreciate it very much. I'm working on another book about petitions oh. from the town of Lexington in oh. the 19th century to the Massachusetts General Court Ooh. and what they were involved in. Ending capital punishment, better treatment for released prisoners, uh, women's suffrage, and the fugitive slave law, etc. So well, when would we expect that to be well, published? Um, Maybe to 2023. Oh, soon. I mean, a, well, another uh, year or two. It just two. takes me. <laughs> I'm a slow historian. Uh -huh, that's okay. So, you're anyway. <laughs> Take your time, get it right. right. Yes, right. yes, that's my theory. And I want it to be interesting. Yeah. I mm -hmm. don't want it to be, oh. <laughs> It'll be interesting. Oh, that sounds thank like you. an interesting subject. So thank you, so thank you very, great. very much. Well, I'd like to thank you all for uh, watching this program today. We were very uh, pleased to have Mary Keenan with us. And um, if you're interested in other um, Lexington Remembers programs, please go to Google Lexington Remembers or Lexington Remembers YouTube, and you'll find a lot of very interesting um, programs to watch. And again, I'm Beverly Kelly. This is Peter Kelly, and we thank you very much for watching. <laughs>